Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson, and today we're pleased to welcome back to the program James Turk, founder and chairman of Gold Money, which offers investors an easy and inexpensive online solution for buying precious metals with international storage options. Now, James is one of the foremost authorities on precious metals and has long offered market forecast commentary, including co-authoring The Coming Collapse of the Dollar and How to Profit from It with our good friend John Rubino of DollarCollapse.com. James has built his career on decades of experience in international banking and finance, spending many of those years living outside the U.S., which gives him a critical advantage to look at our economy with outsiders' eyes. I'm really delighted to have the chance to talk with you again, James. And as a lot of our readers are wondering when precious metals are going to break out of the trading range they seem to have been stuck in over the past year, are you up for sharing your thoughts today? Yeah, I definitely am. And it's good to speak with you, Chris. Oh, it's really great to have you here. You know, you recently wrote uh, that gold delivered a positive return in 2012 and that the 10-year rate of return measured across eight major currencies was double-digit positive in each one of them. That's across a 10-year time frame. Quoting you directly, you wrote, gold is not an investment. It can't possibly be an investment because it does not generate any cash flow. Gold is a sterile asset. It's money. And money does not generate any return unless you lend, deposit, or invest it. Money does not generate a return when stored in safekeeping. Well, James, uh, where did those uh, returns come from then? Yeah, it basically came from depreciation of the dollar. Uh, in other words, the purchasing power of the dollar is being uh, eroded away uh, month by month, year by year. Uh, and that's true for all of the world's fiat currencies. And a good way to measure it is an ounce of gold still buys the same amount of crude oil it did a year ago, 30 mm -hmm. years ago, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you didn't increase your wealth. You basically just preserved it, which is what money is supposed to do. Well, so do you see anything, anything at all here in early 2013 to suggest that this erosion of fiat money is going to abate soon? No, I don't think it is. And I think the important point, you know, getting back to that quote that you were saying about, you know, gold is money and it's not an investment. You know, Warren Buffett was half right when he said gold wasn't an investment. You can't apply standard investment techniques to analyze gold because it's, it, it doesn't generate cash flow, you know, as I said in that quote. Um, when the price of gold goes up, you're basically taking wealth that's already been produced out of the hands of people who own fiat currency and transferring, transferring that wealth into the hands of people who own gold. Um, so you might become wealthier, but the world as a whole is not becoming wealthier by a rising gold price. Mm. This is a really important point because if for so long, you know, the currency itself was the measuring stick. And as long as your measuring stick had a fixed length, it was a useful measuring stick. But in this day and age, with everything going on with the ECB, uh, the Bank of England, uh, the Federal Reserve, Bank of Japan, uh, among others, uh, just printing like crazy, the measuring stick is it's rubber now at, at best and rubber that stretches one direction. I guess. Yeah, if you use fiat currency as a measuring stick, but there's nothing to stop you from calculating the price of goods and services in terms of gold. And, you know, I do that regularly, regularly on important things like the price of crude oil, you know, what the Dow Jones and other stock markets around the world cost in terms of, of gold, um, and, you know, commodity prices generally. And once you do that, you get a better idea of what's truly happening to the world's the uh, currencies. And more generally, the link to gold was broken. The formal link to gold was broken by President Nixon back in 1971. A whole new set of language had to come in to be politically correct. You know, if gold was supposedly demonetized back in 1971, it couldn't be called money anymore. They had to start calling it something else, and so they called it an investment. But, you know, there's an old Chinese saying that wisdom begins by calling things by the right name. Mm. If you call gold an investment, you're starting down the wrong street. Um, and you're analyzing it the wrong way. What you need to do is recognize that in a portfolio, you have two components. You have your investments, and then you have your cash or liquidity. And what gold is, it's money. So you have to compare gold to the other forms of liquidity, you know, the various paper mm. currencies. And you'll see that you're generating 
double-digit rates of appreciation in gold relative to the fiat currencies because the fiat currencies are being debased by various government and central bank policies around the world. Oh, I think that's that's an incredibly good way to frame it. So we have investments and we've got liquidity, cash, and gold is money. So in this day and age, we've uh, one of the things that I've noticed, though, is that uh, well, let's talk about this. Both gold and silver experienced really impressive right price run-ups in 2011 before experiencing pretty sharp, pretty painful corrections. Uh, silver's was especially savage, dropping from 48.70 in April down to 26 bucks roundabout by year end, I think. Uh, 2012 saw a much more muted range of prices for both gold and silver. So, can you recap the factors then leading up to this extreme volatility seen in 2011, and maybe postulate why the metals have been range-bound since? Uh, given all of the printing efforts that have been going on. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Well, you know, the way markets normally work is after you do have a big move, you get a correction. And, I mean, even over the past 12 years, if you look at gold, you know, you had big moves in 2005, uh, 6, and 7, where you were in some years generating over 20% appreciation in gold. And then, uh, and then you had the correction in 2008. Even though that was a correction, gold was still up that year, though. And then in 2009 and 10 and the earlier part of 2011, you had, again, big moves. So then you had the correction where basically, you know, they've moved sideways. And my guess is, is that 2013 and 2014 are going to be big, big moves on the upside. Because what's important here, Chris, is not so much the price of gold, but whether it's, you know, good value or not. You know, the proper way to manage a portfolio is you move assets that are overvalued out of your portfolio and you concentrate on assets that are undervalued. And that's true regardless whether you're talking about investments or money. You want undervalued forms of money. You want undervalued investments. And by my measures, and I use a couple of mathematical formulas, which I've written a lot about, one being the fear index and the other one being the gold money index, by both of those measures, gold is still very, very undervalued, as is silver, for that matter. Silver is even more undervalued than gold. So my expectation is that, these undervalued assets will continue to rise in price because what the market does not like is it doesn't like levels of overvaluation and it doesn't like levels of undervaluation. The market is always constantly, you know, changing um, those, um, or, you know, moving money out of overvalued assets to moving into undervalued assets, and that's what we're basically seeing in the precious metals. People are moving out of overvalued fiat currencies and moving into undervalued gold and silver. Um, so, you know, my guess is that 2013 and 2014 are going to be big up years, but we still have to contend with, you know, the central planners and the various government policies, which, uh, you know, have been actively trying to keep the gold and silver prices from reaching fair value. But, you know, they're losing, uh, the central planners are losing the, uh, you know, the, uh, the war. They may win an occasional battle or two, but they're losing the war, and eventually gold and silver are going to go higher assuming that governments and central planners and central banks still continue to follow the same policies that they've been doing, which is debasing fiat currencies. I have so much to talk about uh, in, in your comment there. I just want to touch on one piece of it, uh, because you, I think you, you hinted at it here, which is I've often written about uh, the broken price discovery process in the precious metals market over the last few years, and in, in particular the recent past, uh, there seem to be an increasing number of occurrences where a large player or entity sells off a huge futures position in several minutes, sometimes just a few seconds or even milliseconds. And this doesn't seem to me to be a legitimate method of unwinding a position, as the mainstream press usually characterizes it. It's obviously designed to move the price downwards. That's what you do when you dump 3,000 gold contracts in 80 milliseconds. Uh, such price insensitivity it's hard to justify any other way than having an intent to drive the prices lower. I, I know our regulatory bodies will never look at this. I'm just wondering, have you seen this behavior, and, and do you have a, an explanation for it or a way that, that would help us understand it? Yeah, I, I think I have seen it, and I think you've done a good job explaining it. It's not a rational way to, uh, to operate in the markets, nor was it rational for Gordon Brown to announce in advance that he was going to be selling half of uh, Britain's gold reserve. I mean, after all, Warren Buffett doesn't announce in advance when he's going to be buying something. He only does it after the effect. So if you're a normal profit-driven investor or, or someone who's managing a portfolio and you're normally driven by profit, you don't take those types of actions. But central planners aren't driven by profit. They're driven by politics. And when they see the price of gold rising, 
um, they see that as a, a, a warning sign, just like the market sees it as a warning sign, that central banks are destroying the purchasing power of the currency. So rather than go and fix the policies that the central banks are pursuing, they instead intervene in the gold market to try to keep the gold price from rising. And what, what's the effect when you take a, a commodity, because money is a commodity, and you uh, keep its price down? Shouldn't demand go up? Yeah, it does. And it, that's really an interesting thing, because you know when we saw this um, little price drop in gold in uh, silver at the end of 2012, the demand for physical metal you know, rose tremendously because people recognize that these assets are undervalued and if they're going to be sold down to such cheap prices, they may as well just pick them up and continue to accumulate them. So it sort of has a perverse effect when they intervene. Uh, and, you know, in fact, as we've noted, you know, gold's risen 12 years in a row against the U.S. dollar, um, double-digit rates of appreciation. But I guess the best way is to use an analogy. You know, if you've got a, a, a a pot of water boiling on on the stove, uh, and it's bubbling away. Every once in a while, you have to release or pull off the lid to let a little bit of steam out, and then you put the lid back on. And that's sort of what the central planners are doing. You know, every year they release the lid, and you know, gold on average rises has risen over the last 12 years 16.8 percent. And then they put the lid back on. But one of these days, the, they're not going to be able to put the lid back on, and you're going to go into the third stage of a bull market where gold just keeps rising and rising and rising because confidence will be lost in the currency. And I think that's what we have to be focusing on. You know, John Rubino and I touched upon this in our book, The Coming Collapse of the Dollar, and that, you know, at some point in time, confidence will be lost with the dollar, just like it's been with every other fiat currency throughout history. And you're going to see a flight out of paper and a flight into physical metal. And that might happen within the next couple of years. I, I think we're getting that close. Well, I noticed a, a couple of interesting uh, news articles recently. One was that through November of 2012, I don't have December data yet, China had imported uh, or had openly imported 720 tons of gold through the Hong Kong facilities, and that India was seeking to put extra curbs on gold imports because they were bleeding out uh, a lot of their uh, uh, current account reserves were, were going out because so much gold was being imported. And I thought that maybe both of those might have been indications that this is what happens when you keep the price down. Demand goes up, possibly. Yeah, that's absolutely right. But, you know, there are other factors as well. Wealth goes to where the wealth is being created, mm. and a lot of wealth is being created in Asia. And so consequently, a, a lot of gold is, is moving in that direction. Just like back in the, in the uh, late 1970s, uh, in early 1980s, when the price of crude oil was rising, a lot of wealth was going to the Middle East, and a lot of gold was being accumulated there. So, you know, there are a number of factors that drive the demand for gold. Um, and I suppose another factor that needs to be considered when you talk about Asia is, is the traditional, you know, cultural values. You know, they understand that gold is money, and it's an important part of a portfolio. Uh, and they tend to save, you know, gold or silver rather than paper money because they recognize that gold and silver preserve purchasing power over long periods of time, uh, which is sort of interesting, really, because you know the Indian farmer understands that, but a lot of people uh, in the West don't. Um, so, you know, go figure. Well, then this uh, uh, releasing the pressure from the boiling pot, as it were, has has a couple of effects. There, there's really two. Uh, things that the the central planners have to sort of manage here. One is the price can't be too high because it'll send the wrong signals about their policies, but it can't be too low because otherwise all of it will flow from from west to east. And uh, how do you think they're doing at that managing process here? Um, they're probably doing pretty well. Uh, to be honest, hmm. I didn't think it would go on as long as it has. So I, you know, I got to give them um, credit for the fact that they've been able to manage it as long as they have. But you know, here's the 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 um, the key in terms of the end game that you know there's a difference between physical gold and paper gold. Uh, physical gold is the actual tangible asset. Paper gold is just a financial asset with a promise to pay gold at some point in time uh, in the future, or you know an asset supposedly backed by gold, but not necessarily gold actually sitting in the vault. So uh, what they what governments and central planners do is you know they are constantly uh, using anti-gold propaganda. Um, you know, that's why Gordon Brown announced in advance that he was going to be selling the gold reserve. And there have been other instances since then about, you may remember, you know, not too many years ago, how they always threatened to sell the IMF gold. 
when they finally sold it, it got snapped up in a in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. So they don't use that as a threat anymore. But there are other things that you know they're they're constantly doing to belittle and disparage gold. But the reality is is that you know this physical gold is of limited. They can't create it from bookkeeping entries like they can create dollars or pounds or Swiss francs mm-hmm. or you know euros or any other currency. You know, gold comes from a, a very difficult process of mining it from the earth, with, which requires a lot of hard work and a lot of capital. So central banks do have gold in their vaults, and occasionally they have to sell some of that gold um, in order to you know, make good on their promises to deliver in the future. But given the fact that there's so much paper gold out there relative to the limited amount of physical, eventually you're going to see the final stage of a monetary collapse or financial collapse um, which always happens throughout history, which, you know, people eventually move out of financial assets and they move into gold. Because what they want to do is they want to avoid counterparty risk. And when you have a financial asset, you're always dependent upon someone's promise. But when you own a physical uh, physical metal, be it gold or be it silver, you're not dependent on someone's promise because you have a tangible asset. There is no counterparty risk. You know, one of the more interesting pieces of news that I heard recently that really supports that view is the idea that, uh, some of the larger Japanese pensions were looking into the future and saying maybe we should buy some gold for our portfolios. They they have you know hundreds of billions of dollars at their disposal, and of course this is a perfectly logical thing to do because they're sitting on an extraordinary amount of Japanese government bonds at zero percent effective interest rates. And uh, the new Prime Minister Abe said, "Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna jack up uh, inflation to two percent," and he has the Bank of Japan's backing on that. So what's the logical pension manager with a fiduciary? responsibility is supposed to do when you know your currency is going to be debased and you're getting a less than real rate of return on on your official safe holdings what kind of an impact do you think that would have on the gold market if if funds of that size started really moving in force into the gold market yeah i think it's going to be big i mean we've already seen it in some ways there was a, a i think it was the texas state teachers pension fund had put some uh, precious metals in uh, some some of their assets into physical precious metals uh, and then a couple of years ago, a New York hedge fund, a big one called uh, Greenlight, actually took its uh, shares of GLD and actually asked for metal instead of shares. It wanted ounces, not shares. So, I mean, we've already seen some trends in that direction, but this is typical what you see in the second stage of a bull market. You know, every bull market has three stages. In that first stage, you get apathy, ne- neglect, nobody's paying attention, but, you know, the asset is really, really undervalued. Uh, in the second stage, and that's where gold is and has been since it took out a thousand dollars an ounce. You know that was a, a worldwide media event to see thousand uh, dollar gold, and as a consequence, gold has been getting a lot more attention in the media, and a lot more people are starting to understand the advantages of owning gold. And during the second stage of the bull market, you see tremendous price appreciation uh, as more and more people jump upon jump on the train, recognizing that. Hey, you know there are really advantages to owning gold, and it's you know undervalued, and um, that's the second stage. The third stage is when the speculators and you know uh, jump in board, and, and gold starts to become overvalued, like it was back in the end of 1979 and January 1980. You know, its last big um, price peak in, in a bull market. Uh, but that's still you know some point in time in the future. We can't predict when that point will come. But we do know it will come, uh, and we just have to wait and see you know, for when it finally arrives. But it could happen in 2013 to 2014, 2015, but you know, maybe I'm early. Maybe it's going to take you know, three, into the three years, it might take five years. Well, let's talk about this uh, position of where gold is, is in terms of its being undervalued or overvalued. I know you mentioned that uh, when you're thinking about portfolio balancing, what you really want to do is move out of the overvalued into the undervalued areas. I've seen some charts you've put together where you're measuring the Dow, for instance, or the DAX or, or uh, any of the other stock exchanges in ounces of gold. And it kind of looks – it's it's neither – Super overvalued or undervalued at this point by those measures, uh, historically speaking. Where do you where do you see gold uh, from a portfolio standpoint as measured against equities right now? Yeah, it's about nine or so ounces the purchase of the Dow, um, uh, or you know thereabouts, maybe a little bit less. I can't remember the exact number. You know, back in two thousand, it was forty ounces was necessary to purchase the Dow. Bear markets in in an uh, economic bust and and bull markets in gold and when it's one to one. So in the 1930s, uh, the Dow 
Jones Industrials, believe it or not, was 35 and gold was 35. And then in 1980, you know, gold was 850 and, and the Dow was 850. Hmm. Um, my guess is, has been that, you know, it was going to be 8,000 on the Dow and 8,000 on gold when we again saw that one to one ratio, which I was expecting between 2013 and 2015. But because of all of the debasement over the past several years is worse than what I could, had foreseen. I think the price is going to be much higher. And presently, my gold money index is saying that the fair value of gold is $11,000 per ounce. So I think that's going to be closer Mm -hmm. to the mark in terms of um, the price that we see for fair value. And typically, markets go beyond fair value. So, you know, who knows what the final price will be on gold? We just have to wait and see how it all unfolds in the years ahead. Well, certainly we will. And and perhaps there are some signs that it's, it's coming forward. Let's uh, 2020 is a number on my radar screen because Germany shook the markets last week by announcing its intent to repatriate its sovereign gold reserves, 100% of the holdings that it had in France and a portion, I believe, close to half the holdings it has in New York. And, uh, of course, they, they weren't going to do this all at once, which would be not that hard to do. It's not you know that big of a shipment, but they're going to take till 2020 to do that. Uh, Venezuela's already done this. I just saw a news report a couple days ago that the Netherlands is now showing some signs, at least uh, uh, at the popular level, of maybe following Germany's lead. It appears that trust among the central banks is waning. Is that is that what's happening here? Uh, what do you think the implications are? And, and um, I know that you were going to be writing a, a piece for us around this. So I'm just wondering if you have a few things you could share with us around this. Yeah, you know, I can't say that trust between central banks is waning, but you have to recognize that there are two categories of central banks. There are central banks that are in the U.S. circle of control and dominance, and then there are central banks outside of the circle of U.S. control and dominance. The ones that are outside of U.S. control and dominance are accumulating uh, physical gold. Um, The ones within the U.S. control uh, tend not to do that, although it's interesting that Germany, Netherlands, and now Austria, too, are talking about you know bringing the, bringing their gold back. Um, I think we're going to see more of this. And the interesting thing, though, Chris, is that you know if central banks are doing this, our institutional investors that own GLD, SLV, and you know the other big precious metals um, ETFs, are they going to say we want to own ounces, we don't want to own shares? You know, we want physical, we don't want paper. Um, it, I think this is. You know, something that actually started a couple of years ago when Greenlight did that conversion of its GLD shares into physical metal. And it's starting to pick up momentum. And, in fact, this is, again, typical of the second stage of a bull market. You know, people want the real thing. They don't want a a substitute. Well, I guess particularly after, uh, personally, I've had an erosion of my own, which is an erosion of faith that uh, contracts will be honored when push comes to shove. And and this, you know, obviously MF Global and Peregrine and and some other fairly largish things like that have convinced me that uh, rule of law in one of the most trusted market environments in the world, which is the United States financial markets, is is not what it used to be. And so perhaps is this a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, or is this uh, just a common characteristic that happens in any bull market in a commodity? Well, it's a common characteristic in any bull market in commodities, but the logic is exactly as you say. You know, uh, one in hand is worth two in the bush, or actually worth more than two in the bush, because... They're entirely different things. Tangible is different um, than a financial asset. You know, physical is different than a paper asset. And you know, what will be a driving factor in the next few years as this financial bust we've been in continues to unwind is the avoidance of counterparty risk. You know, it's quite clear that a lot of promises have been made, particularly by you know, politicians in most governments around the world, and that those promises cannot possibly be fulfilled. A lot of those promises are going to be broken. And particularly when it comes to the area of gold, a lot of central banks are relying on the promises of other central banks that, oh, yeah, we'll be good for the gold if you ever ask for it. But, you know, those promises are likely to be broken as well as the demand for physical metal continues to grow. Uh, You know, whether it's going to accelerate in 2013, 2014, I don't know. But my guess is the demand for physical metal is indeed going to accelerate over the next couple of years because I'm really looking for, you know, some serious financial problems to, to be hitting. Uh, you know, the U.S. is not addressing its debt problems. Uh, Western Europe is in a mess because the economy is sinking and the euro is being politicized. U.K. has got its own worries. 
Japan is now out to debase the currency, you know, starting various currency wars. It's a real mess out there. Uh, and these problems are ultimately going to um, impact the banking system because these two interrelated crises, the sovereign debt crisis and the bank solvency crisis, uh, these crises are still ongoing. We're sort of in a quiet period, but the problems are still there and haven't been solved, and I think they're going to get worse uh, as we go forward um, you know, in 2013 and 2014. Oh, fascinating. You know, I'm, I, I really like that framing. I hadn't thought of it this way, that there are two spheres of central banks, one under U.S. control uh, and influence, if you will, and, and those that aren't, and those that aren't are in the accumulating phase uh, for gold, at least as a reserve asset. And uh, we see China having an unofficial policy of, of accumulation by encouraging its citizens and opening up its gold markets uh, for what we might call private accumulation. I, I guess it doesn't really matter where the gold sits as long as it's inside your borders. It can be in a vault. It can be in a, a drawer in somebody's house. And both of those are, are probably good enough when push comes to shove, I would guess. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, one of the things I like to stress is that in years gone by, and I'm talking about decades ago, uh, maybe a century ago, <laughs> you could sort of trust central banks to do the right thing. Um, and you could sort of rely on them. And with the exception of the Bundesbank in the past century, you know, no central bank has really re ever really done the right thing. Uh, they've always ultimately bent over to political force, uh, the will of the politicians. And the most recent example is the Independent Bank of Japan now setting a 2% inflation target, which is exactly what the Japanese government wanted. Um, the Bundesbank is the only one that's stood tall as being an independent central bank. But the point I was making is that you can't really rely on central banks anymore. Everybody has to be their own central bank. You have to own your own gold, own your own silver, um, for the same reason that central banks uh, have that metal. It's, it's your reserve. Um, you know, if fiat currencies do collapse, that gold and silver will be your reserve that you can use to continue to um, operate your business, uh, live your life. Uh, you know, obviously it's going to be a difficult environment if currencies collapse, but if you have that precious metals in your portfolio, you don't really have to worry about it because you'll know that you're protected. I mean, gold's got a 5,000-year track record. It's been through everything, and it continues to, you know, do what it's done for 5,000 years. It's money. It preserves purchasing power. That's absolutely fascinating, and I, I think you and I are both on a similar page when it comes to the future of fiat currencies. Uh, it seems that the major economies are intent on destroying the purchasing power of their paper, either on purpose or because uh, the central banks, which are supposed to be independent, have become political captives. So where are we on this fiat currency death watch, as it were? A and I'm really interested <clears throat> in closing here with your advice to those who are looking to protect their wealth. What are some practical guidelines for uh, say, a portfolio allocation, how much, you, as you mentioned before, you have your investment income, you have your liquidity. Where would you split that balance in, in a general way at, at this point in time? First of all, I'm not an overall specialist in portfolio management. I'm, I'm really just a specialist in the precious metals. And I know that the precious metals you know, should play a big part of one's portfolio. But you know, typically when you're uh, – let's put it this way. If you look, past, uh, if you look over the past, uh, past century, you know, we, we can see these booms and busts. If 20s, you had a boom. 30s, you had a bust. 50s and the 60s, you had a boom. 70s, you had a bust. 80s and 90s, you had a boom. And we've been in a bust since the stock market peak back in, in 2000. And when you're in a bust, there's a general rule of thumb. You want to avoid financial assets. You want to focus on tangible assets. And I'm talking about tangible assets of all sorts. Not only you know gold for your money part of your portfolio, but tangible assets for the investment part of your portfolio. You know, own things like uh, farmland, uh, own things like oil wells or gold mines, or commercial office buildings if they make sense. You know, there are a lot of tangible assets out there that don't make sense. You know, second homes in uh, overbuilt areas, you know, don't make sense. Second homes in the south of Spain uh, don't make sense because the values of those tangible assets are going to go down, and you can't really get enough income from rental to justify it as a as a uh, undervalued asset. It's in fact, it's an overvalued tangible asset. So the mix between investments and cash, it's really hard to categorize. But, you know, generally in a, in a bust, I would say you want at least 50% of your portfolio in a liquid form. And if you're older, you probably want something higher than that. And if we look at the cash component of your portfolio, a good rule of thumb is your age. 
um, and this sort of applies to your, your whole overall portfolio. You know, if you're 25 years old, given that gold is undervalued, you might want to have 25% of your portfolio in, in gold at the moment. If you're 70 years old, you might want to have 70% of your portfolio in gold at the moment uh, because you need that liquidity. You don't want to take risks. You need the security that uh, gold's 5,000 track record, 5,000 year track record provides. So I would use that as a rule of thumb in terms of how much precious metals you want to have in your portfolio. And if you want to have some silver as well, typically what I recommend is to have two thirds of your portfolio in gold and one third in silver of your precious metals portfolio. Two thirds gold, one third silver. Because even though gold is undervalued, silver is undervalued relative to gold based on the gold silver ratio, how many ounces of silver it takes to buy an ounce of gold. You know, we're at 52 ounces right now, and it's typically 16 ounces of silver historically has, has equal the value of, of one gold. And as 2013 uh, unfolds, the desire to move away from uh, counterparty risk, people are going to understand that silver is not an industrial metal, uh, only an industrial metal. It's also a monetary metal, and that 52 ounces of silver does for you the same thing that one ounce of gold does. Uh, it gives you money and liquidity outside the banking system. But I, I will caution that silver is more volatile than gold, and therefore it may not be for everyone. But, you know, if you do feel inclined to accept that volatility and take the long-term view, then I do recommend have a third of your precious metals portfolio in, in silver. Absolutely. I, I agree. And, and that was a general ratio I started with. I guess when I first uh, started with gold and silver and, and really rebalanced my portfolio in a pretty aggressive way, it was back in 2002, and I went 50-50 between uh, gold and silver and my other assets. And since that point in time, it's grown to a little over 70%, even with some rebalancings along the way, just because it, it keeps climbing uh, so aggressively. And I can't find anything that I'd rather have my money in for the moment. So it's it's uh, I'm a little ahead of your year-by-year uh, -year ratio because I'm 50, and I'm sitting at a little over 70%. But that feels right to me at this point because um, I have a – I have a, a old saying I live by, which is that uh, if you're at a card game in Texas and you don't know who the sucker is at the table, it's you. And that's my shorthand way of saying I can't analyze where the risks really sit in the financial world because everything's so muddy, so opaque. We have these mark to myth accountings. We've got other sleights of hand. We, I'm sure that there are things that are being underreported or just absolutely not being reported that, that are material. And given the fact that I can't assess where the risks are, I just feel it's safer for me to take my chips off the table, walk away from that particular card game for a while until I gain some clarity into where the world really is. It, it seems just obscure and muddied and unnecessarily opaque at this point. And so that, that's me. It's just a question of safety. I truly believe in Richard Russell's maxim that you know the primary purpose of a bear market is to take the most wealth from the most people. So flip that around. He who loses least wins most. And, and that's always been my strategy with precious metals, not a get rich quick scheme. It's really to lose the least in what I see as a really turbulent period of time. Yeah, I think that's good advice when you're in a financial bust. Um, you know, the times are definitely tough. And there's one other element to this general advice that I would add. It, it all comes down to we have to do whatever we need to do to sleep well at night. You know, mm -hmm. we can if we know that ourselves and our families are protected come what may we can sleep well at night and you know basically that's what it's all about you know planning for a future that nobody knows how it's going to unfold because we can't predict what's going to happen all we can do is move into undervalued assets and stay out of overvalued assets and that comes back to you know accumulating gold that's undervalued accumulating silver that's undervalued and getting rid of fiat currencies as much as possible or any exposure to fiat currencies because they are overvalued. Fantastic advice. Well, James, we've come to the end of our time. I'm just wondering if, if people want to follow you and your work more closely, where would they do that? I'm the founder and chairman of Gold Money, and you can find uh, me and my colleagues um, and our, you know, our research team at goldmoney.com. And what we do is we buy and sell precious metals for our customers. Uh, we've got almost 23,000 customers in 100 different countries around the world from our base over here in Europe. Uh, and we store gold for you in five different countries around the world, Canada, UK, Switzerland, Hong Kong, and now Singapore, where we're actually having a, mm. a special promotion because we're the first uh, company to open up the, uh, the opportunity for people to store you know, gold and silver uh, at vaults in Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, so at goldmoney.com, it's all explained. 
Fantastic. Goldmoney.com. We've been talking with James Turk, founder and chairman of Gold Money. And James, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Chris. 